families, creating a lifetime of memories. Sadly, some families are denied these important moments due to the sad practice of alienation. These are Families Divided. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Families Divided TV. We're so glad you could join us. In this week's segment, attorneys Jordan Traeger and Ashish Josie will speak to us about the courts. Jordan Traeger will first speak to us about attorneys who represent children in parental alienation cases and what exactly is the best interest of the child. Also, Ashish Josie will do a short segment on do American courts recognize parental alienation? And that is a huge question that really needs an answer. So we're gonna bring these to you as soon as we have these messages. Divorce and co-parenting are a major life interruption for families, especially the kids, but also for parents and grandparents. And it's even worse in blame-filled, high-conflict cases. When parents engage in alienation by turning the kids against the other parent or grandparents, kids suffer. They're denied the opportunity to build the four big skills necessary for future resilience. New Ways for Families online class can help. Parents learn to use our popular Biff and Ear skills to calm the conflict and stop the hostile emails and texts. And we even have a class for kids and parents to learn together. Research shows a 75% improvement in joint parental decision making after this course is taken, plus overall improvements for kids' well-being. Don't wait to make this affordable investment in your children's future and improve your well-being too. Start learning new ways for your family today at conflictplaybook.com. Hello, my name is Jordan Traeger. I am an attorney with Whistleman Harunian Family Law, a law firm on Long Island, New York. Uh, I've been doing uh, parental alienation cases and family law for over 25 years. And today's topic that I'm going to be talking about uh, deals with attorneys for the children, uh, parental alienation, and the best interests of the child. So one of the big issues and not, I'm, even though I'm going to be uh, talking about a couple of cases from the state of New York, these cases can be broadly applied anywhere because the, the readings of these cases and the, the thinking of these cases really uh, are something that would be applicable to all 50 states. So as a background, uh, what is the role of the attorney for the child in New York? Uh, like many states, uh, the role is to represent uh, the wishes of the child. And that goes for whether the child is a teenager, uh, a minor, or even a toddler. Um, so that is the role of the attorney for the child. So now for obvious reasons, uh, when dealing specifically with a parental alienation case, we could see that that role is not the ideal role. Uh, and can actually, in some, in many circumstances, run counter to the best interests of the child, uh, their own client. So how did we get to where we are right now? So before the turn of the decade, uh, before the year 2000, uh, maybe for about 30, 35 years from the 70s uh, towards all the way up to the end of the, of the century, uh, the role of the attorney for the child was actually to represent the best interests of the child. Um, that was the role of, at least in New York State. And I happen to, to know that in many other states, that is also the case. Um, so what would happen is a child would come to court 
they would express their wi express wishes, not just in a parental alienation case, but any kind of case. And what would happen is the attorney for who was representing that child would need to make a determination as to whether or not their own client, the child's wishes, were something that was in their client's best interests. In New York State, uh, there was a law passed in the 1970s that was the, it was called the Friederwitzer case, but it's, again, it's the type of case that probably applies to all 50 states, which says that the role of the court is to, do, is to uh, further the best interests of the child, and the attorney for the child would also try to further the best interests of the child. Now, something happened uh, around the turn of the century here in New York where those two things diverged. And what I mean by that is the role of the court still continued to be uh, to represent the best interests of the child. That did not change. There's a doctrine called parens patrie. What that essentially means is that the court uh, needs to be put in the shoes of the parent in trying to determine what is the child's best interests. But the role of the attorney for the child changed. And what the court started uh, ruling and saying is that when a child is represented by an attorney, their primary role is not to represent the best interests of the child, because that's the court's role. The role of the attorney for the child is to represent uh, what the child wants, to look at the child as their client, to represent their client's wishes, irrespective of whether those wishes are in the best interests of the child. So the reason why they did that is because they said, well, even though this uh, it's a child, a child is an independent person and they should have their wishes heard by the court. Uh, the court should know what the child's wishes are. They should not be treated as um, merely a piece of property between the mother and the father or between the two parents, but rather someone who has his or her own interests. And those interests should be represented by the attorney for the child. And that made a lot of sense. But there was one uh, area of the law where it really didn't make a lot of sense. And that's in parental alienation cases. So uh, I'm just going to very briefly uh, just let you know. And, and again, this is even though this is a rule in New York State, I would imagine many states have this. Uh, and it says that the attorney for the child has an ethical obligation um, to represent the child and must zealously defend the child. So. What it says is that in ascertaining the child's position, the attorney for the child must consult with and advise the child to the extent and in a manner consistent with the child's capacities and have a thorough knowledge of the child's circumstances. All right. So basically what they're saying is the attorney for the child needs to speak to their client and make sure that they have an understanding of the proceedings and their own interests and to, to treat the child as any other client, whether, you know, as a, almost at the way that you, uh, an attorney would represent an adult. And then it goes on to say that if a child is capable of knowing voluntary and considered judgment, the attorney for the child should be directed by the wishes of the child, even if, and this is where, this is where um, the law changed, even if the attorney for the child believes what the child wants is not in the child's best interests. Uh, the, the attorney should explain the options available to the child and recommend to the child a course of action in the attorney's view that would best promote the child's interests. So the attorney really needs to explain to their client, listen, I'm not sure that this is in your best interests, but if the, the child then turns around and says, well, I don't care, this is what I want, then the attorney for the child must advocate uh, the child's wishes. Now, again, in a non-parental alienation case, oftentimes uh, this makes sense. And I'll give you an example. Suppose a child says, listen, I love my mom. I love my dad. I want to see both of them. I want to spend time with both of them. But I don't want to sleep over dad's house during the, during the weekdays. I only want to sleep over dad's house on the weekend. 
because it's very disruptive for me and, and I don't want that. But I definitely want to see dad. I want to spend a lot of time with him. I love him. He's great. I just don't want the overnights during the week. You know, that is what we would refer to as a typical type of um, custody situation. The attorney can then go to the court and say, listen, I have a client. He loves his mom. He loves his dad. He wants to spend a lot of time with both of them. He's not He's not saying he doesn't want to spend time or or to talk to or be with or do things with either parent. He just wants to have um, a, a role in determining the schedule by which he is going to spend time with mom and spend time with dad. That's appropriate uh, for a custody case. Now, here's where things go off the grail a little bit. Supposing that the child turns around and says, uh, I don't want to see dad ever again. And they and the attorney says, well, why did he do something to you? Did he physically abuse you? Did he mentally abuse you? Did something happen? And the child just says, I just don't want to. And they say, well, what was your relationship like with dad? Um, you know, you know, they don't say before the litigation started, but that's the idea. And the child kind of shrugs his shoulders. I don't know. And, you know, and the attorney opens up a book full of pictures and says, look, you were spending time with dad every single day. Um, you loved him. You know, it was a great relationship. What changed? And the kid kind of just shrugs their shoulders again. And then the case goes on and it becomes very, very obvious at some point in time that and, and by the way, I don't want to say it's just mothers that do alienation. I'm only using this as an example. It's about 50 50 half the half the time the father's doing this. But for the, for the purposes of this example, I'm just saying that uh, let's just say that the mother is the one doing it this time. And but let's say it comes out that the mother has been uh, denigrating dad over and over and over and over again and doing everything humanly possible to destroy the relationship between uh, dad and son. So what happens here? So now th what I say in a situation like this is this is a situation where the exception proves the rule. What does that mean? That means in the normal circumstances, the so-called normal circumstance, which I gave before, which is I don't want to sleep over during the weekdays. I only want to sleep with dad on the weekend, but I still want to see him and spend time with him. That's the rule. The exception, of course, is the parental alienation case. And what is the law here in New York? And again, I would imagine that there is something similar in other states. So what it says here, for the attorney for the child, when the attorney for the child is convinced that either the child lacks the capacity for knowing, voluntary, and considered judgment, or that following the child's wishes is likely to result in a substantial risk of imminent serious harm to the child, the attorney for the child would be justified in advocating a position that is contrary to the child's wishes. And then it goes on to say that in these circumstances, the attorney for the child must inform the court of the child's wishes, uh, notwithstanding the attorney's position. So there is an exception in the law that says where either the child's wishes would result in substantial risk of imminent serious harm to the child, or the child lacks knowing, voluntary, and considered judgment, an attorney can substitute judgment. And when they substitute judgment, what they're doing is going back to the standard before the law change, which is best interest of the child. The attorney is going to, notwithstanding their client's position, to advocate the best wishes, uh, the best interests of the child. And one circumstance, in at least in New York, and from what I understand, other states have been following this as well, one of the exceptions where they say that a child's wishes are, are, will result in a substantial risk of imminent serious harm or where the child lacks knowing voluntary and considered judgment, lacks the capacity, is in a parental alienation case. So I'm just going to give a couple of uh, cases, and these are just sort of for illustrative purposes. I don't, you know, obviously these are New York cases but they kind of illustrate the thinking that's been going on now. And one thing that's happened prior to this, this law has been on the books for quite some time. 
Unfortunately, uh, attorneys for the children have not made great use of it. Um, sometimes what they do is they will, uh, I have he heard a number of situations where the attorney for the child will uh, kind of soft pedal the child's wishes during the trial to kind of, kind of wink, wink, uh, nod, nod to the judge that they have to do this, but they really don't believe that it's the child's best interests. And that was going on for quite a while. And then at some point, the court, these attorneys for the children, these courts said, well, we, this is kind of ridiculous. If the child is being alienated and the attorney for the child believes that the child's in risk of serious imminent harm or lacks knowing uh, and considered judgment, they should just be able to go right on in and just advocate for the best interests of the child. And a couple of cases, believe it or not, these children are teenagers. You know, we like to say, well, you can't go against what a teenager wants, right? When a teenager says it there, you know, there, there's this urban legend that when a child turns 13 or 15 or whatever age, they can make their own decisions. Um, but in parental alienation cases, it's a little bit different. So I just want to uh, talk very briefly about three, three court cases in New York um, and how the courts decided. So the first case was the Silverman case. Um, and what happened in the Silverman case is the attorney for the child took a position contrary to the child's wishes and substituted judgment. In this particular case, the court did not find, found that the attorney for the child acted improperly. But I looked at this particular case and I don't feel that this was really a true parental alienation case. What happened is that the parties had joint custody with residential to mom. Uh, the mother had residential, fa the father had a parental access schedule, he had therapeutic uh, parenting time, and the mother filed an order of protection, a family offense petition alleging domestic violence. Um, the family court awarded the children uh, a temporary order of protection, and then the father asked that, uh, then at that point, the court conducted a, what's called an in-camera interview. What they do is they will bring the child into chambers and talk to the child with the attorneys, the attorney for the child's uh, present, but not the parties and not the party's attorneys. And after, the, uh, after this interview, the court vacated the family offense petition and said that dad should have overnight parental access and other various types of uh, parenting time, over essentially overruling uh, the child after speaking to the child. So, um, and the child at the hearing actually said that he didn't want to have overnight wishes but it, with his dad, but he did want parenting time with the, his dad during the daytime. He actually said that. And so what happened is this, this decision went up on appeal and the court gave weight uh, to the child's wishes and said that uh, the child's age, intelligence, maturity, educational att attainment, all of that was taken into position. And they did not believe that parental alienation created a substantial risk of imminent harm to the child. And agreed to do what the child wishes were. So I don't know that this is necessarily a negative case for parental alienation, this particular one, because again, the child did want to see his father. It was a matter of trying to fix his own schedule. And this is part of the philosophy of, of not treating the child like a piece of property, but rather listening to the child's wishes. Now I'm gonna give you two more cases very briefly. Uh, one is the Viscuso case. Um, which basically there was a concerted effort by one parent to interfere with the other parent's contact with the child. And the court said that it was so inimical to the best interests of the child to raise a strong probability that the interfering parent was unfit to act as a custodial parent. So in this case, there was also, um, I guess an isolate, what they call an isolated incident of domestic violence. I don't know what that was, maybe, you know, it's the decision doesn't explain it very well. It could have been a smack or whatever. And the child said that they did they wanted to reside with their mother and they wanted absolutely nothing to do with the father whatsoever. And in this case, the uh, attorney again uh, substituted judgment 
And the court said that there was a sound, substantial basis in the record to conclude that the mother interfered with the father's relationship with the child, blatantly and repeatedly violated the court's directives, attempted to instill in the child fear of the father, and, and other things. And this also went up on appeal. And this particular case on appeal was actually upheld. And what they said is that the attorney for the child properly substituted judgment. And it said to follow the child's wishes would be tantamount to severing her relationship with her father. And that result would not be in the best interest of the child. We include the mother, and then of course they, they say that the mother's persistent pervasive pattern of alienating the child resulted in a substantial risk of imminent serious harm to the child. And we conclude that the attorney for the child acted in accordance with her ethical duties. So it took the opposite position. And then there's the last case, the Creer case. Uh, this was a case where the child refused to have any contact with the father for about four years. And there was a, a long history of parental alienation. I actually had the opportunity to, even though I was not representing Mr. Creer, I actually was able to call his attorney and I had an opportunity to speak with him because I wanted to get some background on this case. In this particular case, the attorney for the child actually did not substitute judgment and advocated the child's wishes that he didn't want to see his father. And the court, what's interesting about this, said that the that they did not give great weight to the child's age, intelligence, and maturity. Even though the child, this child was 15 years old, 15, and they said that the child was mature, intelligent, but on the issue, the sole issue of his relationship with his father, the child was so profoundly influenced by his mother that he cannot perceive a difference between the father's abandonment of the marriage and the father's abandonment of him. And it was against the best interest of the child uh, not to have a relationship with the father. And they said that the attorney for the child should substitute judgment. So why is it important for an attorney for the child to substitute judgment in these cases? Um, just briefly, oftentimes the courts will rubber stamp and go along with whatever the attorney for the child says, but that's starting to change. And uh, one of our hopes is that, A, the courts will not automatically go along with whatever the attorney for the child wants, because what the child necessarily wants may not be in their best interests, and in a parental alienation case is not in their best interests. And number two, um, the attorneys for the children should be able to substitute judgment in these cases. They should not feel afraid or hesitant that they're going to be sued or a grievance will be filed against them or anything else. So that's the conclusion of my presentation. And uh, if you would like to reach me with any questions you may have, I will be happy to speak with you. And I thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you. Families Divided will return in a moment. Hello, my name is Ashish Joshi. I'm with Joshi Attorneys and Counselors out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. I specialize in litigating cases involving parental alienation around the country. And frequently I'm asked by targeted parents who have had series of experiences with lawyers, with judges, with court-appointed professionals, and have got nowhere. And the question is, how do we find a lawyer to present a case of parental alienation in a court of law? And there are several ways to go about it. Like searching for any good professional, you need to do your due diligence. So when you are meeting with a prospective lawyer, ask the lawyer who's going to do the work. Is the lawyer going to do work on the case himself or herself? or are any associates going to be involved? Is there a junior partner? Who is going to work on your case? You need to know that. Second, ask the lawyer about the difference between a case of parental alienation and a high conflict case. 
there is a difference between high conflict, custody or divorce case, and the case of parental alienation. And it's absolutely critical to not only know the difference, but to make sure that you present the case in the right way before the court. If the case is presented as a high conflict case, the assumption is that each party, each parent, shares the blame in the family dysfunction. And that could have a completely different trajectory for the parental alienation case. Find out is the lawyer up to date on the recent research, professional literature on parental alienation. Ask about the top five articles peer-reviewed that have come through in the past five years on alienation. Ask the lawyers about top decisions in your jurisdiction or in other jurisdictions that pertain to parental alienation. Look for any publications. Has the lawyer published any articles? Has the lawyer presented at conferences, state bar associations, national conferences on topics involving alienation? Ask about how does a particular judge or judges in that jurisdiction view parental alienation. Do the judges accept the phenomenon? Do they call it by any other name? Are they resistant to accepting parental alienation and its consequences? And if so, what does the lawyer plan to do? Ask about references. Has the lawyer represented clients who have been in a situation similar to yours? Assuming that the confidentiality rules and regulations allow it, ask for an opportunity to talk to those people. Would the lawyer allow you to speak with the former clients that he or she has had? What did they go through? What sort of experience did they have? Look up case law. Ask the lawyer to provide you with decisions where he or she has represented a target parent. How did that case turn out? Ask about the lawyer's uh, choice of use of experts. What kind of expert witnesses, if any, does the lawyer like to use? Who are these people? Look up their bios on the internet. See if there are videos available. The more you ask, the more you search, the more you read, the more you will find that a particular expert is or is not suited to get you to present your case. At the end of the day, it's your life. These are your children. And you need to do the due diligence to find the right lawyer to present your case. Thank you. Join us next week on Families Divided TV when Dr. Coley Murray talks with Dr. William Fabricius regarding equal parenting time and children's mental and physical health.